I guess as a very introductory question, what's spurred on the development of this for you? And yeah, I mean, basic questions, why drones, why opera, why, why theater? That's a good question. Um, it was the first live performance I directed. It wasn't really intended to be a live performance. It was originally pitched to my gallery as a um, painting performance at an opening of an exhibition that I was gonna put a canvas at either end of the gallery and then with drones paint during the opening party and the mess would remain up and be the exhibition and <laughs> it didn't go well and it turns out to be illegal at, as well you're buying paintball guns inside so it became something else and what I liked about that was this kind of playful way of making visible what was a political abstraction so we sort of read about drones we hear about state assassinations we hear read about executions, we read about other things, but we don't really feel them and we don't really see them. And I wanted to make something that was a visceral response to a political abstraction. So it became then a different thing. It was actually going to be at Isaiah 2013, a new media festival. And, um, but as a very short 10 minute performance, that was still with the painting. Um, and then that actually lost its money and um, became something else. And so then with Experimenter, it was sort of this idea that it would become a longer thing and it would actually become a more fleshed out thing that I originally wanted to have some human relationships with some sort of conductor of the emotions so that the drones would be the, the kind of MacGuffin in a way and the humans would be the sort of way that the emotion was sort of brought to an audience. And so originally it was dancers and so I had a choreographer, Shelley Lastra, I worked with quite closely and we sort of thought about what would the movement language be, how would we kind of do that with drones, and then what we realised was the drones and the, and the dancers were actually too similar, and they were really both serving the same function. So I thought, you know, what's kind of the opposite end of that, something quite Baroque and something quite emotional and something quite demonstrative, and came up with opera, which, um, which is weird. I've never been to an opera, I've never seen one. I mean, I've heard opera, but I just thought, I think that's something I wanted to ask you about, about that choice of opera when um, there are so many genres available to you. And I was thinking about like, the, this kind of combination of uh, sort of the, the high culture canon of opera and the classicism of opera versus this obviously new technology, this kind of bleeding edge technology. And yeah, yeah I guess just why opera and why not another genre? Yeah, I mean, part of that, it was quite conscious, the prejudice about both, you know, the, particularly kind of the hacker culture the drones had come through and, you know, and other things I'd worked in had been seen as quite lowbrow and opera had automatically been seen as quite highbrow. But it was also sort of an emotional, you know, it was sort of about dynamic range in a lot of ways, like what was the furthest out in each direction I could go and sort of opera emotionally and technically and culturally was sort of a, you know, the black point and the white point, as it were, of... of that idea so it was just as far away as I could get and I thought I quite often worked with sound artists and people in films and things like that and I thought that was a little similar in fact there was a sound artist making a live sound score all the way through but the opera was sort of a way to separate those as well I should also say that there was very very many collaborators involved and that was not something I did on my own there were you know as an opera composer there was a sound artist there's a set designer who sort of worked with lasers there was a lighting designer, there was three opera singers. Um, so the, yeah, it was a very collaborative process. Yeah, so within that collaborative sort of timeline, like, can you just talk a bit about the development of each individual element? And the, we're at a session called the Dramaturgy of New Media, so I'm just kind of very curious about, uh, yeah, just like, what does your whiteboard look like when you're trying to map out this happens now, this happens now, that energy now, that energy now? Yeah, we should have done a whiteboard. That's a good idea. Um, it, it was, uh, so the producer was Kate Richards, who was an artist whose work I'd followed for quite a long time, and she ended up also becoming, having a dramaturgy credit, actually. So it really is Kate, you know, discussion that Kate was the person I most often had this discussion with. And it was really a discussion mainly about how the, the interesting thing is in the technology. That was something we were very aware of as a risk from the start, as something as fans and practitioners of new media as well. It is, I think, a risk often 
about it can't be top gear for drones. It has to be the emotional kind of core has to be the reason. But we were also very kind of nervous and a little bit sceptical in narrative in this as well. It, it was really about how this was a, a sensory narrative and a sensory kind of dramaturgy, as it were. So we were, you know, the way I sort of approached each, each person that we worked with was by saying that, was saying, I don't want the drones to be the interesting part and I also don't want this to be the story of, you know, state assassination is bad and we shouldn't do it and here's a bunch of white papers and this is what I feel, you know, we didn't want to animate a bunch of white papers. And so, you know, for instance, the opera singers was a good example. So they said, oh, do you want us all to, the composer said, do you want us all to audition? And I'd written the text, so the, the libretto was almost entirely from CIA training videos, the, the way they train pilots, so these quite camp act videos with actors pretending to be drone operas and they do the call and response and that is mainly the text all the way through. And so we sort of they said, do you want to audition? And I said, well, I'm not sure. You'll, I couldn't tell you apart. You'll all be, you know, I'm not very musical. You could all be wonderful. And so I just took them out for coffee. And basically it was the ones that didn't run away. That was the idea. It was the people that could be, you know, think on their feet and improvise and do it differently every night and not have it written out exactly. And because opera is you know, usually quite technical. So that was the scene. You know, Robin Fox, I also wanted to work with people that were specifically artists, people that came from gallery backgrounds, not so much theatre backgrounds. So I think there's a different approach to experimentation and a different approach to failure. And so I wanted the, the development process to be one of failure and, and the response to that. And so each person, it was also important, they didn't do their regular day gig. You know, so I'd you know, known Robin Fox and been a fan for a long time, but I also didn't want him to do his regular thing. So we talked about how that might look different. And so he we sort of wanted to do the set design. So we kind of thought of the lasers as the set design and architectural carving up of the space. Um, Phil Samantzis, who's a sound artist, wanted to do something that was quite improvised and different every night and blending field recordings rather than a gallery version of field recordings. Um, the lighting designer is someone who usually does film. Um, and, and video for galleries. And so that was sort of the process, was sort of talking to everyone about the way this contributed to understanding drones and the threat of assassination, you know, and, and an anxiety about technology as well. So that was... Yeah. From an audience perspective, it's quite an interesting experience to go into an auditorium and be confined to a cage. So there's this rope cage around the audience that... Um, well, it acts as, I mean, it has its own meaning that we're sort of confined in that way and it's another layer to, um, to have this barrier with the audience. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah. And whether that's, I mean, a drama dramatic decision or also a legal kind of ramification? So many functions. It was, it was a safety function. Originally, I actually wanted it to be people in um, really small, like the Guantanamo Bay cages, that everyone was going to be in those Gitmo cages. And there's lots of reasons why that didn't work and was oh and and um, lots of other <laughs> and expensive. Um, but it was partly to, co you know, the whole thing was this choreography of anxiety and that was one of the ways that we kind of raised anxiety and also made you feel contained with other people. There was nowhere you could go. You were given sort of, we sort of scripted a, a briefing at the start that sort of maybe slightly overblown one about what you could and couldn't do and when you could and couldn't leave and how, what the process for that would be. But it was really to, to make people aware of how contained they were and also how powerless they were when the drones were flying. So I had the start and the finish for about three years. That The start, if you remember, was, didn't end up being complete darkness, but the original idea was that you'd be in complete darkness and you would feel the drones fly over you. And so we used quite a big one at the start. And there's actually quite a lot of wind that they generate. And so you would feel the prop displacement and you would hear them quite loud before you could see them. And that, that would give you a sort of a phenomenology of what it felt like to be you know, under the threat of drone attack or actually this kind of perpetual surveillance. So on a dramaturgy level, what we did is we had three, we made a triangle that had sort of te you know, terror, so terror or sort of violence, um, fetishization, you know, sort of the fe fetishization technology and surveillance, this idea of the drones as flying panopticons that you can never get out of the frame, that the frame will always follow you. And so each scene was sort of designed and constructed with one of those 
points of the triangle in focus, but all of them present in each scene. And that was really the kind of the process of the dramaturgy of it. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I know that you've worked in this project with some hobbyists, some ultra hobbyists, these uh, this kind of drone collective. Yeah, can you talk a bit about that process of finding these guys who are really into what they do and how, how was their experience of sort of being transplanted into this theatre show? Yeah, that, that was kind of interesting. So there was the, um, the super nerds, as we call them, were kind of... Um, one was a friend, the main other co-pilot is actually my studio manager as well and someone that I've, I've known for a long time through sort of a hacker. He's sort of a hacker and he was also someone that... Um, I knew from 3D printing and things like that. He'd made his own 3D printers and we'd sort of worked together on that in previous projects. And I just wanted people that were... So we tried a whole lot of technical solutions to how you fly drones inside in the dark without GPS, which turns out to be harder than you think. And we decided that actually the best solution was a good human, that there actually all the technical problems had much, much more points of failure than a good human did. And so because this is relatively new, there's not a lot of people that have five or ten years' experience with this. And so... Um, and the people that do all know each other. And so I sort of, through Matt, who's the person I sort of share a studio with, we found that we would solve the problem that way. So actually the way most of it's flown is, the, is trust, essentially. So we have comms on and I'm sitting under the lasers in the dark usually and everybody takes an axis, your pitch and roll, and just reads numbers into my ear and um, we fly that way. So read some um, bearing numbers and distance numbers. Is that generation of control data, I mean, that could be also used for another purpose in some ways. Like, I guess you have a script with placement of certain objects at certain times. So how hard would it be to restage this? In a um, it, was, it was actually my contract that I never do it again. Um, <laughs> it's extremely stressful. Um, it wasn't so much dangerous for, uh, for an audience, it was dangerous for the performance and it was dangerous for us. And we were just, and danger in the sense of it could fail, you know. So the things that were kind of three levels of failure that we sort of identified of, you know, someone getting hurt, the performance being interrupted, the performance having to stop. And so there is kind of a line in the probability curve that reaches one eventually with a, enough performances. And so... Uh, <laughs> And, and my partner told me I was a total pain in the ass while we were doing it and that she would rather I didn't do it again. So, but yeah, so that idea of the human involvement and actually it being something that didn't happen over and over again but actually that could fail, could be sort of done in an analogue way in a sense and also could be different every night was what I wanted. And so the strengths of the process and what I liked about it were also its limitations. I guess on that kind of question of taking it Further or not, um, I know you've got plans to like, regenerate the material into a, a film project. Yeah. yeah. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, of course. So the discussion I had with the experimenter really early on before we did that was that I think the best way for this to have a life after the performance was for it to be a video installation. And so from before we did that, we so planned how it would be shot and how it would be also a different experience to the, um, to the performance. So what you can do, what can you do in film that you can't do in a performance? And, you know, so you can have close-ups, you can cut, you can move. You know, in rehearsals you can move a camera around the actor in a way that you can't when you're stuck in a cage. And so I used two um, feature film cinematographers. We planned that out and shot that. We also captured as much as we could from everything else, so from the drones, from analogue vision mixes that show a screen that the audience sees, from GoPros, from just everything we could think of. And then put it together in an experience that would be a two-channel floor-to-ceiling video installation. It's actually quite a low-res video installation using sort of panels of LED pixels rather than a screen. And focused on the sound quite a bit too. So we, the, we put an enormous amount of effort into recording the sound in a way that we could move it around and spatialise it, separate channels and also keep the opera kind of... You know, the, the integrity of the opera, how the singers wanted it. And then... We've, about halfway through, each of the cinematographers came up separately and said, actually, we think it could be like a single channel film festival version. And so we're also in the process of making a film festival 30 minute version, which will be very, very different from the performance and from the video installation. So the process of taking one work and saying, what's the experience of that when you're live and what do you lose and gain when it goes to a gallery and then what do you lose and gain when it goes to a cinema where you can't leave and can't move around? 
has been a really interesting underway way of you know, understanding duration and and you know what you can communicate physically rather than what you need through narrative and what a sensory narrative might be versus a information narrative. So we've put things back in the videos that we'd actually sort of tried and experimented with in the performances and taken out. I imagine you could have quite a sort of a lot of spatial information contained within a multi-channel audio setup. Yes. Like if you had a you know a 5.1 mix, you could actually generate a lot of that. Uh, internalized spatial space. Yeah, and, and body and space. It turns out to be the main thing is that, you, you know, what changes everything is when you can leave. So, like, when you can hold anxiety to the point where people have to stay and when they can leave. And so that, that idea of bringing people in through narrative, like, again, narrative's kind of the... the, um, the, thi the MacGuffin, the thing that gets you to eat your vegetables and then you stay and you, you kind of get, get the phenomenology of it. And so it was always very important to the process of doing the, the dramaturgy actually of the opera was taking narrative out. I started with a lot more narrative and then through the process of development I just kept taking it out and out and out until it you know, still had a spine, just enough for it to hold together. And then the process of the film has been like which kinds of narrative do you put back in? There's very little text. In fact, this is a very, very early rough cut of me just doing title design for seeing what sort of information you might need. So the overarching kind of shape of it is the Icarus myth. So there's a promising technology, there's hubris, there's a fall from grace, and then there's a sort of a flatlining afterwards. And the um, subtitled lines are poem is lines from the Ovid, the poem about Icarus. And um, that was just there to sort of orientate people to to the to the idea. But in the opera, it's actually like sung in a way where you can understand it. And it's the only part of the opera that's quite legible. So, what I didn't realise and it actually took a long time to work out and, and work around was that you actually don't hear the words in opera. You actually have to stop people and talk and actually have them sing in a different way if you want to hear the words. And so we talked a lot about when you would hear the words and when they would just be a sensory experience. And I think just winding up this little interview with a very big topic. Um, so backtracking to your talking about drone technology and the anxiety of drone technology and state sanctioned killing. Like looking at that production, I wasn't beaten over the head by that content, but it obviously has informed your development of the piece and your your production. So that's a credit to the work that it doesn't have that kind of that uh, overblown sort of uh, that delivery of that message. But can you talk a bit, about, a bit more about your interest in drones and that kind of socio-cultural impact? Yeah, I'm kind of interested in, in the way drones have been used as a way to avoid, you know, for, you know, so when war becomes one-sided, one it becomes policing. And so the drones are really more police actions than war and then military actions for me. And so how do you actually communicate that to an audience rather than... I've always been very interested in politics in, in, in art and it, almost all my works have a political layer, but I've also been quite uncomfortable about the history of sort of activist art and sort of how you kind of find a way through that without making this literally a performed white paper about why drone assassinations and state assassinations are bad and the kind of way we sort of tried to get to it was through a phenomenology of it that you would just feel anxiety rather than be told about anxiety. And um, that would be, um, that was kind of the way to do it, was sort of really avoiding saying it. That's wonderful timing because the file has finished. So please thank Matthew Sleeth.